um, on correctional management as that fits within the frame of empirical legal studies in law and psychology. Thank you all for coming here on time. covering today follows on um, quite closely to some of the matters that we were discussing yesterday regarding social identity uh, and humanism. Uh, and so one of the themes that we will be exploring uh, throughout the material is the extent to which those sorts of frameworks apply in correctional management. Now most typically you might expect that you would get to correctional management topics after sentencing, uh, but um, we are going to be addressing sentencing uh, and decision making a little bit later, and I think uh, this way you'll be able to see precisely how some of the issues that we address regarding uh, mental illness uh, and human rights really uh, flow on very well into the kinds of ways that we uh, treat people post Right, so the three main themes that were addressed in the Australian uh, version of legal psychology, of course these are, as in all of the chapters, just a sample of some of the extensive uh, empirical based research addressing these topics to give you an overview of some examples of ways that you can look at correctional management drawing on a research base. The themes that we're going to focus on are, first of all, uh, issues to do with uh, the individual offenders and their own needs and how you manage any risk that might be associated with their offending patterns. Um, second of all, uh, we're looking at the movement um, that is very strong in Australia, New Zealand, um, towards providing therapeutic programs for offenders in prison and how well those work. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about some of the institutional culture uh, that uh, is a strong feature in correctional institutions, uh, particularly looking at some experimental work uh, and other uh, frames that apply to the intergroup relations when you get people placed in a position of power and authority over others uh, who lack uh, that uh, and are confined. Right. So, starting out then, I wanted to just um, give you a little bit of a synopsis about ways that we classify prisoners in our system in Australia. Um, and I, I guess there's quite a bit of variability as to how different jurisdictions deal with these issues, but we've, we've had many debates um, about the pros and cons of different types of classification systems, you know, and in all of our prisons we get quite a mix uh, because we have people uh, who might have been arrested who don't make bail but are not yet convicted or awaiting trial and they're often kept in exactly the same facility as others who have already gone through trial, been sentenced, and are serving uh, their period of sentence. And so one of the concerns, of course, then, is about the impact of mixing people uh, who might be, you know, repeat offenders, you know, with, with very strong criminogenic needs with others who might, in fact, not yet be convicted and be innocent, or who might be first-time arrestees should be thrown into the mix with other individuals who are very different uh, from themselves. And, um, you know, and then there, there are also concerns um, about what happens if you keep all of one type of offender in exactly the same facility, the same unit in the country. And this has really come to the surface in terms of uh, uh, imprisoning uh, terrorist offenders post-conviction uh, who have typically been placed in the same sort of supermax highest security facilities altogether. Uh, and then what seemed to happen is there was a lot of communication among them 
and there was concern by the authorities that what was going on as they communicated is that those who were not as extremely radicalized were becoming even more radicalized by other members of the groups because essentially they were being confined <coughs> in a social group where they were reinforcing uh, a lot of uh, some of their group values. And so now we have a policy perhaps to try to separate people uh, who are from similar kinds of ideologies uh, or who have committed similar kinds of crimes or who might come from similar kinds of cultural backgrounds because it's a concern that you don't want to have gangs form in jails from people um, or, or, or groups that might have in fact all been gang members already who simply, you know, given um, a facility in which they can all fraternize and reinforce uh, that perspective. And so this debate has raged because the typical norm is to try to keep everybody who has the same sort of security classification, at least in the same kind of unit and facility. And so all prisoners are graded in terms of, you know, their security risk. And so our terror suspects have the highest security risk label, you know, which is an AA or an A123 or whatever. Uh, you know, which means that they're usually grouped with, um, you know, serial uh, homicide offenders. Um, in, you know, in, because that's the only other kindred group. Uh, and, and yet, there might be vast differences between those individuals in terms of their uh, offending patterns uh, and commonalities. So, those become, um, you know, challenges for the management. So we had, a, we had a case example uh, in our textbook about uh, the Ben Brika trial of a dozen uh, terrorist uh, detainees prior to trial uh, that, that we used as an example to talk about some of the issues about treatment of detainees. Um, and uh, that was a, a case that was running in Melbourne a few years ago. I think it came to trial in 2008. And so some of the facts that I've listed here are just an example to highlight some of the issues when there are these vast concerns about people being dramatic uh, risks to security. So what happened with those detainees is they were, they were kept prior to trial in a maximum security facility, which turned out to be at least 60 kilometers away from the court. Uh, and so, uh, that made it very difficult as well uh, for their lawyers, uh, barristers, or solicitors to consult with them uh, in preparation for trial and even for their family members and friends to visit them uh, prior to trial. So visitation was restricted as part of the conditions under which they were detained. Um, they were, um, you know, uh, detained in um, cells where they were let out of the cell only for one to two hours a day. So they were uh, separated uh, in segregation um, or solitary type of confinement um, with no relief from that most of the time. And then when, when the trial began, they had to be transported uh, to Melbourne uh, to uh, the, the, uh, the court where uh, they could meet with their lawyers and judges. And it took them about 65 to 85 minutes a day each way. And the conditions of transportation were very onerous. So they were uh, shackled, their handcuffs were chained to belts so that they had very, very restricted movement. Uh, they were strip searched, even though they were under video surveillance all the time, they were strip searched before they got in the car or the van. And the van had little cubicles that could each uh, contain two uh, prisoners at a time, and they were very uncomfortable. All of the controls for temperature, etc., you know, were uh, with the drivers and the guards. Uh, and as a result, they began exhibiting neck and joint pains, fatigue, inability to concentrate that was observed in court. Uh, and eventually, an occupational psychologist was retained by. Um, a group of the defense lawyers, uh, you know, who indicated that their conditions were such that they were rendered in the same state of capacity as uh, individuals who might have been intoxicated over the limit uh, and were therefore incapable, really, of providing good directions to their counsel. So the way the case was called was on the impact 
uh, on their capacity to interact and provide uh, sensible legal instruction to their legal counsel, you know, which is a very fundamental right to a fair trial. So all of this was used as a, in, in an argument about the impact on fairness of trial at that stage. And as a result, uh, the judge, uh, Judge Mangiorno, um, actually went and sat in the van himself so that he could personally uh, assess you know, the kind of confinement issues that were uh, being alleged. Uh, and ultimately, he made a very dramatic ruling about the insistence that these individuals be treated no differently from any other offenders who were awaiting trial. He required that they be moved to the city jail so that there wasn't this onerous transportation that was fatiguing them. He required that there would be no strip searching, no detours of the vans on the way, you know, between uh, the Metropolitan Remand Center and the jail, uh, you know, um, and, and that they get far more time, 10 hours out of their cells a day uh, when they didn't have court and also uh, insured access. So, so that was regarded as, you know, a much more um, uh, evening of the, of the playing field. Uh, for the high risk versus the non high risk suspects. Yes? Like, I was very really fascinated by the fact of the judge going and sitting in the van himself, and you know, as a result of it coming, accepting the opinion of the uh, occupation therapist because he actually found a personal confirmation. I, I find that you know, in India, too, what you found is the most. Uh, you could say uh, judgments which are coming in, which are empathetic to the condition of prisoners, also have come from two kinds of judges very often. One who do uh, pretty regular kinds of visits of going to prisons and looking at conditions there and stuff, or others who possibly in their own student days or earlier, you know, have experienced what it is to be in prison. For in the early years, we had people who during the freedom movement had done it. In latter times, you had like Krishnaya's very many judgments come from the fact of that you know, you know he was one of those strident kind of student leaders, has a background of having seen what prison conditions are. So one of the things which seems to come on a very constant basis, if the judge has some level of an experiential connection with prison conditions, they tend to be more empathetic. You know, this, uh, like some of the more torturous kinds of things, you know, like when he did away with bar fetters, we had a judgment from the Indian Supreme Court wherein you held that using of bar fetters in prisons is unconstitutional against the right to liberty and stuff. And then there were people who kind of started, tried to question it. He actually said, just put it on yourself and do it and then I'll sort of get you to understand why this is not the way to treat anybody. And I, I, the, the moment I read this part, you know, this resonated big time with me that this connection of that if you have seen it and if you're only hearing about it, if you have an impression about prison and if you've been to it, there's a big difference in how people tend to react as to what should be done and all. And for me, this was a kind of another confirmation that there is a... And I don't think this was a... And there was an expert evidence coming, which had been done after a fair amount of extensive study. I'm just saying one of visits seem to also have that kind of an impact. You know, just people who do these very regular kind of surveillances. And we've had... This, this is obviously the, uh, the light away I mean, you have a lot of, you know, judges when they assume office or become chief justice. Some of them go to the nearest temple and kind of give thanksgiving to the Almighty. There are others who tend to kind of also go on these tours of institutions as a way of, uh, you know, that this, this is the body of people who are even much more dependent on me. So hence need to be looked at more. So I thought I would just like that. Thank you. And, and there really is an interesting sort of companion piece to this because there was a parallel trial in Sydney um, with, you know, with a similar group of terrorist uh, suspects around the same time. 
And, and the point I want to make is that there are also perceptions of fairness of justice that get impacted by the Zonera's kind of security uh, treatment in some of the courts. And so what happened in a brand new uh, you know, uh, court facility for large trials that had been built out in Parramatta in Sydney, it was where they held this trial, they put all of uh, the uh, suspects uh, not in the not in the open courtroom. I mean, typically, you know, in an American courtroom, the defendant sits right at counsel table uh, next to uh, his or her attorney, uh, and usually uh, the perceivers in those cases, many of those are juries. Um, you know, see somebody sitting in civilian clothes, <laughs> um, you know, without shackles. Uh, whereas in Australian uh, trials. The defendant or the accused is always placed in a dock, uh, and uh, you know may be brought in before the jury comes in, uh, but is but is often also uh, wearing shackles. And so there's been concern about you know the the need for that kind of security and the impression that it creates. Well, in this terrorist trial in this large new facility, this group of uh, suspects, uh, the accused, were all placed really in kind of, um, you know, if, if this was a flat wall behind me, what they did was they sort of built into it um, an antechamber, and then that was separated from the court by bulletproof glass. Uh, and so there was no way that you could actually hear what was going on in the courtroom if you were the detainee, except through, you know, um, a loudspeaker. And it really did inhibit their capacity to consult with their lawyers who had to phone them in, and they were all in a group. So there was no privacy between one lawyer's ability to consult with uh, his one client or her one client among a group of uh, you know, joint trial detainees. Um, and, and this um, aspect was challenged in advance of the trial. And eventually, what the judge did was order that the glass be removed. Uh, he couldn't get the courtroom restructured, but he was unwilling to bring the detainees actually out into the courtroom. But what he did do was reduce the number of security guards who were sitting in that ante room uh, with the suspects. So that, you know, because that was an even greater threat to the lawyer client uh, confidentiality and capacity to consult. Uh, and so instead of having three or four or five guards sitting in there throughout the trial, um, they were uh, removed. Um, you know, so, so it was a bit of a compromise, not an ideal situation at the end of it, uh, but uh, at least a concession made towards uh, what uh, the ability was uh, to engage in the fairness of the trial and consult, and the perception of people being so dangerous that they had to be you know, behind bulletproof glass uh, throughout the trial. So uh, there's, there's quite, quite a lot more research going on on those topics. Uh, all right, so um, you know, so part of what has been a challenge to, uh, in particular, the clinical psychological community and the forensic and clinical psychologists has been to really try to provide more information on how do you assess the risks of different groups of offenders if you're going to classify people and if risk is one of the issues, on what basis are you going to be making judgments about the depth or extent of a risk. And so there was some information in the chapter just about measures of violent offending. You know, and again, you see surfacing in that discourse this notion of a fundamental attribution uh, error that people are uh, likely to project onto the offender the notion that they're inherently violent um, rather than look at the situational factors that might precipitate violence, that it might be reactive. Um, and, and one of the great difficulties of making assessments when you have people in confinement uh, and you're trying to predict really their risk uh, in jail or out of jail is how do you do it when they're in a confined circumstance where uh, the ordinary triggers of uh, violence that might have got them in trouble and led to their arrest and their conviction or detention are simply not available in a prison setting. Uh, so that, that's been a barrier. So, you know, do, do you follow what I mean? That the, 
the, you know, if you take somebody out of the circumstance in which they've been uh, raided as violent and, and you find it as part of their offense and you put them in a completely artificial environment and then you're trying to figure out how violent they are, <laughs> um, there are some problems uh, in replicating external validity kinds of concerns. And so, so that has been a challenge for the forensic psychologist to address that. And, and the study that we focused on, and the research corpus that we focused on, was done by Michael Daffern at the Thomas Evelyn Center uh, in Melbourne, where they have a forensic detention center, and have focused on looking at violent offenders in particular. And, and what he was able to do was to separate in risk assessment what we call the dynamic factors from the static factors. Uh, so static factors are often used as predictors, and those have to do, um, and typically there are things like somebody's age, because people are more violent when they're young, uh, and you know, violent behavior usually peaks when you're um, you know, at the end of your teens or very early 20s. If you just look at the whole population of violent crimes, and then you know, it tapers off. Um, and so age is a static factor that gives you some predictive power. And then there are things such as the number of prior offenses for violence and so on. Uh, but they don't really help you in the situational issue that we're saying is so important psychologically. So the major contribution of the DASA, which is the acronym for this dynamic test, is to focus on things that do change. The static factors, as you can imply from their label, are things that are immutable or unchangeable in association with an offender. Whereas the dynamic factors are the things that situationally are likely to be the precipitators in response to a particular context. And so what they did on the DASA was that they identified a series of factors that were dynamic. Uh, and then they could weight people on uh, their behavior in relation to each of those dynamic factors. And that tool uh, proved to have, it was validated, and it proved to have some predictive power within a prison environment because it focused on situational aggression in prison. Uh, and so they were able to get through that barrier of uh, the parallel behavior by focusing on situational aggression in prison. And you can see that those are all the kinds of things that might be going on in the circumstance and somebody's response to it that are labeled as dynamic. So the degree to which someone is irritable, impulsive, refuses to follow directions, is very sensitive to what they see as provocation, uh, fast angry responses when they are <coughs> thwarted, generally negative attitudes and propensity to make verbal threats to others. So all of those as a constellation are measured in this scale that had uh, some uses as a tool primarily to get through some of those problems of how to classify people. So it's a very psychometric approach. Yes? Uh, I was I just wanted a specific query because at this point of time, in uh, very many parts of the country, uh, one way of trying to, on the preventive front, and also to focus on uh, like keeping a certain kind of oversight on violence has been this use of CCTV cameras. Uh, and CCTV cameras not just in prisons, but in, you know, like in, uh, in neighborhoods, in institutions, and Shopping malls everywhere. Everywhere. And, uh, and I sort of like was very fascinated by that finding where it said that the CCTV camera as such generated no violence. I mean, some people felt they had to do it aiming to the camera. I, was, I mean, did I get that right? It was I don't, I don't think the finding was that they were more violent, mm -hmm. but, but, um, but that, it, that it didn't seem to inhibit their violence. Oh. Uh, you know, that they were as, you know, they continued to be violent even when there was CCTV footage uh, and they were being observed. And so, um, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that the study compared and found that it precipitated as much that they thought it would inhibit, it, but it didn't. I thought that they were acting out more. It's sometimes, like, what tends to also happen is, like, when you're looking at someone, no, they kind of feel they have to do more. So I, I read that part more in that way. But of 
course, it's not pre it's not preventing, and at the same time, we have all the range of other privacy issues. So it's I was wondering what the what the policy fallout of that kind of research. Right. I, I think when we when we put together the chapter materials, uh, there wasn't a resolution uh, that that indicates that it was regarded as you know negative or positive. What we signed there were mainly the justifications uh, that were enumerated, uh, you know, indicating that it provided more comprehensive uh, surveillance and more more ability if you monitor those, you know, to troubleshoot. Uh, areas, but but I don't think it's been evaluated. You know, so so I would say that was you know an unanswered question entirely empirically. It, so, it simply happened. The policy was implemented without it being evidence based. Right. Okay. So um, you know, drawing now particularly on what we were looking at uh, yesterday with. Uh, mental health needs, we're now looking at it not in a population that is explicitly there with any identifying features of mental illness. These are people in the general prison population uh, who come in without any uh, assessment of mental illness. But of course, what happens is that many of them do have mental health needs and mental illnesses. And so uh, those seem also to be exacerbated by long-term uh, imprisonment and especially segregation. And so in Australia, in response to concerns that have been expressed in uh, international documents promulgated by United Nations and others about uh, fair conditions of confinement, uh, now in Australia there are limitations that you can only keep people in segregation for seven days. Uh, and in extreme conditions that have to be justified for periods up to 28 days, and then there has to be released from that in order to prevent uh, these kinds of high rates of mental order that seem to be associated particularly with isolation uh, and with segregation. But of course, that's a very extreme uh, end, and there are many other mental <coughs> issues um, regardless. And, and one of the major areas of continuing uh, concern in the Australian context is the high rate of deaths in custody, particularly among the indigenous prison population, where all of our prisons are overrepresented by both male and female indigenous prisoners, you know, with a ratio of uh, indigenous population in the country of one to two percent and rates of incarceration you know, close to 40 or so in some of the in some of the prisons. So it turns out, to everyone's surprise, uh, that actually indigenous women are far more likely or incarcerated at higher rates even than their male counterparts. Um, and uh, that you know, up to 40% uh, of the prison population in Western Australia, which has a high indigenous population. Uh, and this has led to some growing concern that there needs to be not a one-size-fits-all kind of approach uh, to all prisoners, but there needs to be much more focus on differences um, and that affect uh, male and then female inmates. And generally, when studies have been done, they have shown that uh, there are different pathways to crime for men and women. Uh, they're not the same. Uh, and that many of the women have more complex needs. They have much more uh, of what we call comorbidity. So they might have, you know, uh, histories of uh, depression as well as personality disorders uh, or backgrounds of domestic violence. They don't. They don't often come with a single uh, issue if it's a mental health issue. So that makes it much more difficult to find even appropriate mental health interventions uh, aside from therapeutic interventions regarding the offending. Um, How come so many women? I could hear. How come so many women? I could hear. Sorry. How come so many women? Ah, uh, I don't know that people can answer. I mean, I think, I think some of that has to do with uh, uh, with, the, with the nature of the crimes uh, and, and uh, offending and, you know, and, 
and the difference in the patterns, um, and that perhaps, perhaps you know, the women are uh, more vulnerable, or there's less scrutiny of who's the offender and who's the non-offender when when people are engaged in violent altercations, especially when they're domestic. It's very difficult to separate the one group from the other. They're often intertwined. Um, it, it's a it's a perplexing. I mean, otherwise, as such, even in the opposite population, the number of women is much less than the number of men. And that seems to me, the, I mean, that in India as such, again, in all kinds of institutions where you have common inmates, the number of women is way less. So the kind of uh, area which is allocated, say, for the women's part of the prison, or even, say, if you go to psychiatric institutions, the, the women's wards, or the segment that is given for women inmates or patients is way less. And their freedom of movement is to that extent also restricted. Because they're given the rest of area, the kinds of like, things like being able to go and work in the fields, you know, like in some of the places, a prison is attached to. Uh, and so if you wouldn't give those uh, out outdoor activities to women, they will be basically given things to do inside the prison. And uh, and, and, and that kind of uh, differential treatment cuts across. The number of women who are as such apprehended and sent for custody and all is also very less. And the lesser number tends to make for uh, more oppressive uh, living conditions because it's seen that it's such a small group of people we don't need to, you know, like, in relation to, I'm not saying that they are as such absolutely small, but in in relation to the male population, they are much less. That's why this seems like a you know very curious thing that you actually have within the indigenous population the women being much more than the men. Uh, and, and and clearly that even among the non-indigenous women, that the mental health condition when assessed of the women versus the men is far worse, uh, more extreme, no matter whether they're uh, from the indigenous or non-indigenous groups. Um, you know, so, so there have been uh, concerns that you need to make adjustments, you need to allow, especially among indigenous prisoners, for them to continue to have contact with other family members who might also be incarcerated in the same institution because of the importance of kinship and community uh, given such a priority in those groups, and and many of these women have uh, children and dependents, so allowing for very young children to stay with their mothers, um, and or alternatively promoting contact by uh, more liberal visitation arrangements uh, or location to facilitate that. You know, those have been some of the adaptations uh, that have been recommended. But in addition, uh, there are there are concerns that some of the death and custody issues have to do with just the physical structure and nature of the prisons. You know, oftentimes cells with very small windows, no access, you know, to light or open spaces. And if you come from uh, a culture where uh, natural environment contact is of paramount, uh, and uh, and being you know in touch with uh, those kinds of cultural symbols is paramount. Uh, they realize that to preserve the mental health of those individuals, they need to, in fact, redesign the prisons to uh, integrate those features into uh, the custodial settings. Uh, and so there have been changes, and, and there are a few that um, we, we can name that have been rebuilt, you know, allowing specific meeting places and creating uh, outdoor spaces uh, much more uh, uh, capacity uh, to, to meet those needs. And then also providing for these women uh, many more interventions and programs on anger management, dealing with domestic violence, often requiring um, quite a lot of education about what does and doesn't constitute domestic violence. Uh, looking at those, uh, and that's my last point there, about the culturally sensitive modes of learning, because it was uh, discovered uh, that they were uh, largely unaware of their own victimization uh, in many instances, and so a, a considerable amount of education was provided uh, while they were in custody. 
and also in order to make it more culturally sensitive, have appropriate trainers, including uh, indigenous trainers and tribal elders who have a great deal of authority in those communities uh, and, and who is there engaged in delivery and, and are in contact with those individuals, uh, it can reduce some of the stress and the negative effects. So there's so much more uh, to do there than, than we can uh, really enumerate briefly, but part of that has uh, to do with um, the adoption <coughs> You know, in 2007, uh, in Australia, what was called the Corrections Management Act, which had as one of the fundamental tenets that you need to respect and protect detainees' human rights. Most of our terrorist laws abrogate those provisions. You know, so they're they're in conflict, and and so we're seeing judgments trying to you know reform things to be more in line with the Corrections Management Act in some instances. But, uh, but I've, I've listed here examples of a few correctional centers that have attempted really to be much more progressive and in tune uh, with those principles. Uh, and there is a kind of a long prison built in uh, the capital of Australia in Canberra called the Macanochi Center. And uh, that one you know, is innovative in the sense that it has a smaller number as a maximum number of inmates, so a total of only 300. Uh, it's much more like a university campus uh, in its appearance, but it does still, you know, have uh, high security on the exterior. Um, it deals with different uh, levels of uh, risk, uh, so multi-grades in our grading system. There are areas where people who are at a lower grade can live in independent types of cottages, have communal meals, and so on. Uh, and then there are more traditional cell blocks for those higher risk uh, offenders. But most innovative perhaps is um, you know, the set of educational programs that are offered. And so um, I know, you know colleagues from the Australian National University in that community um, from the law school who have an entire program with the law students who go into that prison and provide education including legal education uh, in a class setting and on a one-on-one -on -one setting uh, as part of their law degree. So there's uh, is that effort to really uh, do what uh, we were hearing about, how that individual exposure to a prison setting can actually start during uh, the law school phase uh, and is very educational for the law students. And that's proved to be a very popular uh, program as well. You can look it up on the website at A and um, and, and see what its attributes are. Um, uh, the the other uh, feature, in addition to rehab kinds of programs that I'll discuss, uh, is a better um, uh, program for what is a big focus now uh, in all prisons, which is post release and allowing people to transition in a way that is intended to give them more chance of success in avoiding recidivation. Uh, and people have realized you can't just when someone finishes their term of sentence, uh, open the door, you know, push them out onto the street and expect them uh, to survive uh, in a non-offending manner uh, when they don't have any support or an employment or infrastructure uh, or means to really reintegrate. And so through care, uh, is a big focus these days of uh, many uh, many prison training programs that goes on into a post-release community-based support uh, that is getting much more emphasis than even what happens while people are inside uh, prison. Uh, so so that, that prison really uh, implements that. It does have multidisciplinary staff uh, who, who work uh, to try to fulfill those goals. I think it's all too new yet to say that we can evaluate it as a success. It's, um, as you'll see, a fairly new institution. I also just did the example there of a New South Wales indigenous um, uh, institution specifically aimed at new offenders with, with low sentences under 12 months. And the idea here is not to put them in the same facility as those who are much more hardened criminals, 
because what tends to happen then is, you know, prison just becomes a training ground at a school for more offending. Uh, and the idea is to separate these first-time offenders so that they're not exposed to that to enhance the likelihood uh, that they will rehabilitate and reintegrate better by giving them a chance to work, uh, you know, by strengthening really those social identity factors within their community, trying to enhance positive models of uh, indigenous males um, so that uh, they have more support. Some, sometimes these involve extensive mentoring programs uh, with members of the community as well. So much more of a social identity focused reintegration uh, than uh, you know, individual offender traits um, kinds of features uh, that were typical of many other rehab programs. So think about what the aims are um, of the correctional management system in your community. Um, I was pleased when I first arrived at Australia to see that the correctional system included rehabilitation as a goal, because that's not necessarily a ubiquitous feature of correctional systems, uh, but it is an important aspect of what occurs in Australia, and that is reflected in a literal you know, sometimes what I think about is a, you know, vegetables acronym soup <laughs> of programs. There are so many programs with so many acronyms that it's very difficult to keep track of them. Um, and they usually uh, follow a Canadian model in Australia. It's very popular in Australia and New Zealand. And it's called the Risk Means Responsivity Model. And as you, as you can see, those key words have to do with risk of recidivism. And we've learned over the years that we need to measure those dynamic and not just the static factors if we really want to do a good job of assessing risk. Um, and uh, in addition, it focuses on what are called people's criminogenic needs. So this is language straight out of forensic psychology. Um, what do we mean by criminogenic needs? It's not a very transparent label. And it means uh, those kinds of um, mindset features or circumstantial features that are associated with offending. So it might be substance abuse that leads people uh, to commit crimes. It might be a series of cognitive distortions that they engage in uh, that facilitate their offending, you know, such as um, you know, believing that children really enjoy having sexual relations with adults if they're child sex offenders, which is a cognitive distortion that's quite common among those offenders. Uh, it might be, you know, various uh, other kinds of empathy deficits. In other words, not focusing on how the victim suffers because you're not very good at empathy, particularly if you have more sociopathic tendencies. So there's a range of what we call criminogenic needs or criminogenic attributes that some of these programs aim to address. And that really has been a major focus of them. And then in addition, you know, there, I think the big question that you need to ask yourselves here um, is what is the right question to ask when you're looking at all of this? So the typical question that is asked is, can people change? Right, so if you have a fundamental attribution error orientation, you don't think people can change. You don't think they're capable of it. You don't really pay much attention to those dynamic features. But if we if we if we step back, you know, and we just say, can people change? Are we not also committing a type of fundamental attribution error by placing all of the onus on the individual uh, to do the changing? and ignoring the circumstantial issues. So, so I think if I had a critique to offer of many of these programs, um, it has been that in the first instance, a lot of the R&R &R focus was very much you know, individual focused on measuring amenability to change um, and those dynamic factors, and they go so far. You know? so, so if we want to ask the right questions, not just can people change, and I think most of these programs establish that people can change. Um, and so, you know, that's a positive shift in where uh, forensic psychology has made a major contribution to corrections. But I think that we need to think, uh, well, I encourage you to think on a bigger level as to the limitations just of that orientation to take into account 
some other dimensions. And that's really where I think the good lives model uh, offers something, at least theoretically. So that's um, an Australian-born model, although I think uh, Tony Moore, I think Tony Moore's originally from New Zealand, but uh, he's, he has lived and worked in Australia um, a, a lot of the time. And he has drawn on therapeutic jurisprudence type orientation to develop what he calls the good lives model. And the essence of that is that the problem with the R&R &R approach is that that focuses on people's weaknesses rather than building on their strengths. And it's a, a much more negatively focused than affirmative or positively focused approach. And he's very much more looking at these issues from the orientation of human rights uh, and, and uh, you know, saying, look, offenders have aspirations uh, to do the same kinds of things as non-offenders. Let's try to see what are the positive aspirations that they have, reinforce those, whether it's through education or other means, so that they can start to build good lives, because everybody wants a good life, um, and, and capitalize on that. There has been some research on the implementation of the good lives model that's fairly new. Uh, and so I think at the time that we uh, had to send our book off to print, we couldn't sign any formal evaluations on that. I think some have been uh, published more recently. So if you do a search for Tony Ward and his colleagues, various other co-researchers, you should find uh, some of uh, uh, the positive uh, outcomes of that sort of model. You know, so you know, that's, that's at least an illustration of some shift uh, towards a more human rights kind of basis. I have this uh, one question, which is sort of like also comes from some of the experimentation uh, which has been done in India, whether it is in, around the whole area of open prisons or the way in which you, you know, from open prisons, then you sort of let people get back into the community and things. But in every one of them, the original offense that you were guilty of. Uh, or you will I mean, because in, in the context of under trials, it's more to do with how liberal are you making bail and making it easier for people to be sort of, uh, you know, uh, doing trial outside in the community rather than in confinement. But for people who convicted, the original offense very critically dictates whether you will come into a kind of a more liberal model of being uh, taken back. Does the same hold, or is it like that the offense is blanked out and the individual's behavior or whatever else in prison starts to count? I, I mean, because even in the previous the two studies, when you talked in terms of the indigenous people the experiment that is happening in New South Wales, it is for first offenders, it is for, and there's a certain people who committed certain kinds of offenses are just not taken into the ages of such like programs. So I mean, my question to you more or less from a uh, very psychology point of view is this, is it that when people have been one big error that kinds of finishes them forever? Uh, do they really go out of any kind of rehabilitation, uh, reformation kind of because this I find is very common, you know, like, okay, violent offense, sexual offenses, there are some left, some kinds of uh, offenses which are just, people who've committed them are just not considered. Uh, is that a very uh, appropriate way of uh, addressing wrongdoing? I, I, think I, think, I think that the example that I'm going to talk about of the community-based child sex offender program um, is at least uh, an effort to overcome that kind of limitation. I think that in general, uh, I would agree with you that what tends to happen uh, is that the severity of the fence and particularly the nature of the fence dictate uh, very much uh, the kind of treatment uh, that you get and those rehabilitation options. So uh, obviously your behavior in prison does count when you're being considered for parole or be considered for placement in uh, a community setting uh, after serving some time perhaps in a jail setting. And, and I would agree that I think 
the, you know, the whole thrust of what I'm going to talk about in terms of uh, this next community-based setting is to say, gee, well, what if we do take people who are regarded as very, you know, serious, uh, unpleasant offenders and keep them in the community? Uh, are there some ways that that could work effectively uh, by comparison? So the separate reading that I gave you, um, which I think we discussed in the book in this chapter a bit, but also in sentencing, and we won't have time to go to it in sentencing, because it's a bit of a combination between management and sentencing. So I wanted to talk about it today, because I really think it does address your question head on, and I'll be interested to see what you think of it. Um, you know, clearly at the end of the day, as you'll learn, um, in our communities have some quibbles about it. So, as we've seen, there's this policy focus, you know, on the high risk uh, offenders. They usually uh, take child sexual offenders as high risk. Uh, they uh, anticipate that they're going to engage in additional offending, uh, that they're you know, pedophiles. Um, and so the, the normal model is for those individuals uh, to be incarcerated. And one of the problems uh, that emerged when you actually measure them on some of these psychometric instruments is that they actually test very low on things like the static test or even the revised static test. They get scores of zero to one, whereas the highest scores are typically the highest scores. So those have been quite useless in discriminating high versus low risk individuals. Um, and also what we found is that if individuals were arrested for the first time, they should got a shorter offense, and if you were in jail for a shorter amount of time, then you weren't included with the group who really was targeted for treatment. So uh, just, you know, by circumstance, you might have been a multiple offender, but you only uh, were detected uh, once, you know, uh, for maybe something that wasn't horrific, uh, and as a first-time offender, you got a 12-month or two-year or three-year sentence. But that wasn't long enough for all of the assessment and the group treatment programs to be considered. Um, and so you got nothing. Um, and, and that uh, was an interesting finding. Um, we also found that a lot of the child sex offenders are so reviled by other offenders that they tend to get attacked by them, uh, assaulted by them, they, you know, excommunicated in jail by them, they're not accepted in the group and, and many times they have to actually seek protective isolation uh, because they're afraid uh, of those kind of assaults. Uh, you know, one, one of my uh, early cases uh, when I served on a pro bono civil rights panel was to represent a child sex offender who had almost been drowned uh, by uh, his co-inmates uh, just while he was awaiting trial in jail. Um, you know, and, and that happened to amount to a civil rights violation under our law. Uh, and so um, I was on this panel and was assigned to deal with this case. But it's not a it's not a typical kind of event because there are there are uh, different kinds of responses among offenders to different types of offenses uh, in the subgroup and the subculture within prison. Um, uh, in any event. Even if those uh, offenders did get into the treatment program, it was found that they were simply being exposed to higher risk offenders who are more skilled, you know, in child sex offending than they might be, uh, and that had negative outcomes for them. So it wasn't necessarily a good idea to put everybody in the same room for group treatment uh, at all without distinguishing higher from lower risk offenders. And the treatment that was offered didn't have much impact on the low risk offenders alone because it was aimed at others. So overall, what you could conclude if you looked at all of the data was that there was simply no indication that custodial treatment did anything for uh, offenders who want, who were not either long term or you know multiple types of offenders. So the question that was asked uh, was really whether there was some way that they might benefit from a less intensive treatment. And people looking at the whole of the child sex offending spectrum in our community, you know, back in the 80s, 
realized that there were lots of problems with the way the child sex offenders, and particularly intrafamilial child sex offenders, were being processed. Uh, some of those problems had to do with the fact that oftentimes, if the offender was a family member, which they many times were, but in our in our sample, you know, about half of them were biological parents, or just over half were actually biological parents, and others were, you know, siblings, you know, uncles and aunts, um, you know, etc. In the greater family, and. Um, Many times, those who are adults who were primary breadwinners for the group. So if you arrested them and locked them up, there was a detrimental impact economically on the rest of the family unit. And, and also, um, oftentimes, the non-offending parents who might be married to the offender uh, had more loyalty uh, to the offending parent uh, and more disbelief uh, from a child uh, complainant about the nature of the offending. So these tended to be the kinds of offenses that really split the family dynamics very dramatically uh, and created a lot of uh, dissension and trauma and breakup. Um, and so there was very little done. Even if you're just treating the offender, nobody is treating the family or treating the victims and, and all of the aftermath of the offending. So people looking at this set of offenses from a more holistic standpoint thought, what if we do a, a, you know, an in-the-community-based approach so that the offenders can continue working, uh, we protect the victims by implementing you know, no-contact orders, uh, we don't have a policy of um, uh, inhibiting ongoing family contact, among um, offending and non-offending parents. You know, the program was completely agnostic as to whether there should be uh, continued family contact after the program or not. That was up to the individuals, because all of those circumstances were recognized to be individual. Uh, and the way that this program worked, and it started in 1989, uh, was that offenders, once reported, had, had a referral by the prosecution office to a director of this program who was a social worker, who then had to decide whether or not that individual was eligible to stay in the community and go through treatment. And he didn't use any psychometric <coughs> principles or tests at all to assess risk. He interviewed people. And if somebody was uh, eligible, they were advised they had to plead guilty. So a condition of getting into the program was you had to admit to at least um, a certain degree of what the complainant had alleged. And if you pled guilty, then the entire case was suspended until you completed treatment. And if you completed treatment successfully, there was even no record uh, maintained of your offense. Most of these individuals, it turned out, actually did have some kind of prior offending record, particularly while they were juveniles. Um, um, you know, but, but the issue uh, for this research question was the extent to which this diversion from the traditional criminal prosecution route, so there's no trial, no traditional sentencing, no traditional uh, custodial uh, confinement, uh, whether that was effective. Uh, and usually when you're testing the effectiveness of these programs, the target measure that um, you know, the politicians and the government, uh, you know, the prosecutors and the police are interested in are impacts on recidivism rates. Uh, in this case, of course, there was also treatment given to the families and the victims, uh, but those are the focus of what I will talk about. Um, and so what we found was that those who went through the program um, and you know, we did use an instrument to assess their dynamic risk and so on, um, and actually had uh, reduced offending. And I think in the entire you know, 25 years or so that this program operated, uh, there were um, very, very few instances of offenders who graduated from treatment who went on uh, to re-offend. And the kinds of re-offenses that we coded as re-offenses were really de minimis. Um, you know, for example, uh, they, weren't, they weren't 
And I think only one person really engaged in further child sex offending was a sibling of one of the victims. So, you know, one out of, uh, this was a group of about 125 uh, individuals. One actually after the treatment went on uh, to re-offend in that way. And the other things that we counted as re-offenses were, you know, I think one person uh, uh, went to the home of a co-worker and was engaging in what might be classified as prying or peering through the window of a co-worker's house and we got we coded that as a sexual offense. Um, so we had very liberal criteria for what we were looking at. Another, another um, offender uh, on the day that his victim, he learned his victim had died, he became very upset because it had been very protracted years of offending. Um, you know, he was found walking around um, on his uh, veranda in a robe that wasn't closed, and so that counted as exposure, um, though we didn't approach any, any other victims. So, so we counted those as offending. But um, overall, there was a tremendous reduced rate of sexual reoffending, you know, to, to the degree of 80%. Uh, so that was remarkable. So what, you know, this, this treatment program ran for two years with an optional third year if the clinical director thought that the offender uh, still needed more of the group work uh, and individual work. But throughout that time, they were allowed uh, to remain employed. Um, so the benefits of the diversion uh, seem to be that people otherwise rated as you know, high risk, as child sex offending usually is, actually did very well, uh, changed their kinds of uh, offending patterns, uh, reduced the sexual offending, which was the target of the treatment. Uh, the families benefited. Um, there were many other benefits in terms of uh, expanded disclosure. So some of them in the course of the treatment actually admitted to far more offending than even the victims had reported, um, which was remarkable because usually one of the incentives for offenders are to say as little as possible, uh, you know, what you learn from your contact with the legal system is to deny uh, and to, and, you know, not admit. But this program uh, encouraged people to take responsibility. That was the kind of intervention that was take responsibility for your offending. Uh, you had to front up to uh, the non-offending parent or the victim with your, your admissions as part of taking responsibility. So it's a very different kind of uh, intervention. Of course, it saved all of the costs of incarceration. It did incur costs of providing the treatment, but those were no different than the costs of providing treatment within a custodial setting. Um, so we regarded that as a very positive outcome. Um, it did inform us that one of the important things is to match uh, what we call the treatment intensity with the offender needs, which is the principle of R and R, and that maybe you really need only to apply uh, the intensive incarceration remedy for individuals who are, who are really more likely uh, to reoffend. Um, but unfortunately, despite all of these findings, there was um, a lot of media attention to child sex offenders. And um, in 2012, our Attorney General decided that the appropriate policy for child sex offenders was that they must all go to jail. Um, and despite the evidence, they closed down and dismantled this program. and it. I think treated its last offender in 2016, and all of the staff have been fired. So, so that's a, a very sad story about evidence-based <laughs> research, uh, sort of falling on deaf ears when competing with, you know, uh, the, you know, this populist sort of view that fear of crime and child protection requires that everyone go to jail and that it works. Um, why do you think, I mean, I have two questions, but this one, do you think, is it, was it because it was more extensive, or was it because it is like, you can't indulge such like people? Um, I, I think it, I mean, I, I don't know that it was 
such a consideration. I, I think that there was some media attention to a case where uh, an offender, um, you know, was was high risk in the community. There was a, a large outcry by, you know, I, I mean, I sincerely concerned individuals about protecting children. Uh, that this was a heinous crime, and simply the sort of you know law and order mentality of Rutuk, and there was a desire to please the community um, by listening only to that sector uh, and not considering the evidence. And so, I, I, I don't think it was a consideration of costs. I don't think it was a consideration of any other factors. Okay, it was just like a, and the less people who have this. Uh, basic kind of approach, you know, that if you've done wrong of this kind, then you don't deserve of anything. Now my, my other question was actually to connect up with what you were doing yesterday. And uh, there, is this, there is this constant justification that is put for, for compulsory mental health care, and especially in the context of people who are seen to be dangerous by reason of mental illness, to say that if you did not have a compulsory mental health care or institutionalization, then you would be kind of getting these people, they would still enter the system, but they'd enter it from the uh, criminal side. And, um, and as a result, whatever sort of therapeutic interventions can do to help would be denied to them. I was just wondering with your cellar cottage kind of uh, exercise, if you had that as the alternative, and to say that, okay, you do that when they actually do wrong, because dangerousness studies are such, have always been on very uh, slippery ground, you know, it's like you're not, it, it's everybody's just predicting into the future how much of that prediction is really borne out, is anybody's guess. So I was just wondering if like, this was the argument which is put forth, that strengthen what you would do for people if they are, you know, like some kind of a hybrid, you know, of having um, possibly um, some individual pathology combined with the social, social environment, than to say put people into compulsory care, uh, because the sense of wrong on the other side seems to be very high. They feel that they have been picked up before they have done anything wrong. And yet the deprivations of liberty and all those consequences are not even taken on the board. So I was just uh, wondering, if, I saw that connection because, I mean, it's unfortunate that I saw the last bullet point and I said, oh, that's really, but still I feel from a, the fact that there is such an evidence-based study has its policy implications, I think which uh, we can't really close our eyes to. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on the connection between this kind of an intervention and the justification very often put forth for compulsory mental health treatment. No, no, I would agree. I think I think that those sorts of models um, not only do a better job in terms of meeting uh, the human rights kinds of orientation and obligations uh, in the perspective, but are very likely to have greater success. Uh, is they're properly structured. So, so we do. We do, for example, in New South Wales, have a sex offender treatment program in the community for uh, mentally impaired or cognitively impaired individuals, or psychologically uh, dis psychological disability kinds of uh, uh, profiled individuals um, that seem to be. Um, very effective uh, as well, um, and, and the need has been recognized um, for precisely you know, a, a diversion kind of approach to provide that additional scaffolding. I think most of them live in a shared group house in the community. Uh, there are other you know, individuals um, who are uh, professionals um, living with them to provide support. They do sports activities together. Uh, and the idea is just to really uh, provide more positive models and engagement uh, that will uh, deter them from being influenced by people uh, with other models that are negative when they don't necessarily have the cognitive resources uh, to choose appropriately between 
uh, what seems to be, you know, sometimes an attractive, glamorous way to behave uh, negatively if, if that's what seems to be getting social value in a social group uh, versus other positive models uh, to which they're exposed. So, you know, so, so we do have some evidence uh, that those are quite successful as well. Yes? Uh, though it has its own effects, the studies really uh, you know, awesome uh, new uh, experiment, uh, but why it was closed, uh, the authorities know well, but uh, still it has both effects, like sometimes we cannot take the risk and then maybe sometimes uh, if it is needed that would have been continued. But what about the follow-up study on those offenders? That if would give one of them up for many years um, in order to produce those reoffending rates. Um, you know, some of them had completed the program in the very early 90s. Others, um, I think I finished my data collection sample, cut it off, you know, with about 2004, so that they had at least um, you know, another 10, 12, 13 years to reoffend in the community. And so when we measured recidivism, we were looking at quite a long period after their completion to see how they did in the community with respect to reoffending. I was not I mean, I was not committed ethically to contact those individuals personally to find out how they were doing in other spheres of their lives. So all I could look at was whether they landed up uh, being reincarcerated or reoffending on on any basis through my access to criminal records. Um, that would add more to the study in a longitudinal way. Uh, uh, absolutely, you know. Um, and was there any comparative study with this type of uh, uh, treatment and traditional pattern? Um, what we did was we compared individuals who were not admitted to the program. So they became our control group, um, and we compared whether their recidivism rates were similar. And so their recidivism rates were much higher after going through traditional um, prison treatment. But that cannot be decided on short term basis. <coughs> I think, um, but that cannot be decided on short term basis. Because um, this was only for two years. No, but if you know, but if you, I mean, if the, the, the principle. Um, of, of which was more effective, I think, was illustrated by that in Paris. See, see, when it was closed, what the, what the Attorney General said was they'll get treatment in prison. So we're still providing them treatment. Um, but in fact, what our study showed was that people who went through the traditional system and the treatment, you know, did not uh, have their recidivism rates impacted in the same way. And of course, all of the, you know, they, they were going to be a different burden on society and uh, the fracture of the family situation was, was going to be caused. Because what you were talking about uh, in uh, mental illness stigma history, it equally applies to this type of correction and uh, yes. population yes. also. And, exactly, exactly. So the longitudinal effect will make more, give more clarity. I think there's a strong argument to be mounted, you know, on that basis, and so, so I think it really is helpful to have a comparative approach, and, and you know, um, communities like Sweden, for example, are exemplary in the sense that they seem to have far fewer prisons than most other communities, uh, and and so they tend to use more of our, you know, what we would regard as a community-based correctional uh, approach in general. Uh, than to many others, and you know, so so a lot of this has to do with the kind of philosophy that you have about what you're trying to accomplish uh, by uh, sentencing and punishment, and, and um, I mean, I'll just jump to to you know this question over here because I you know I think we're on this topic at the moment about um, if there is a shift away from custodial sentencing, what is the tension then between the goals of punishment and corrections management because there are very traditional philosophies in law about the goals of sentencing. 
um, and are we challenging those or do some of these other newer paradigms about therapeutic jurisprudence and restorative justice uh, mean that you focus more on uh, you know one or two of those traditional goals of punishment? The, these approaches are not really going to be as compatible with all of, you know, particularly the incapacitation um, kinds of approach. But, you know, and I, I'm not saying that there aren't some individuals for whom incapacitation through incarceration might be helpful. Yeah, but if you take your, uh, or good life approach, then I suppose even in incarceration and incapacitation would be seen from that angle where sometimes somebody really needs that kind of disciplining as a way of getting back. And I would then include even those within the restorative justice kind of paradigm or even within, within therapeutic jurisprudence to say that it's like horses to horses kind of stuff, no? that it is, this is what this individual needs maybe a very marking out of boundaries and some level of external support to know what you can do and you can't do. You know, it's it's this sort of thing people very often put forth, especially for child development things that in the beginning children are all the time pushing boundaries, wanting to know how far they can go. And possibly some of us remain children for longer and are still asking for that kind of guidance. Uh, when there are others who are just asking for space to sort out, you know. And evidently the point that you were making earlier of not one size not fitting all, and if these are seen as various kinds of approaches through which correction can happen. It's like some of us work only through incentives. If you kind of like uh, shout me down, that's a certain thing that I'm not going to cooperate in. Even if it is harming me the most, I will not do. Other people can only work if uh, you're told that this is not on. You know, and you're like literally shouted down, so to say. It's, I'm not saying it's a Maybe you know those of us who don't work that they find it really offensive, but if it works for some people and it helps them get back on track, then I think to keep it within the menu card or the repertoire of interventions makes sense to me. But I would still think that the, the way in which the approach with the which with which the good lives uh, perspective at least looks at the matter is a more human way of looking at it. And to be saying that one shouldn't give up the task of recovering people. You know, I think the moment you say correctional management, that seems to me to be the thrust, that you don't give up. You keep trying various things, and I don't think, uh, you know, like, I'm just sharing this with you. It's like if you, if you give up the whole notion of using incapacitation and sometimes uh, a, a more punitive approach, whereas it may be the more appropriate one, then that can be as horrible for the individual person as the not trying of the other may be. Uh, absolutely, and, and studies that have actually looked at the impact of incarceration have tended to show that, uh, first of all, um, the actual potential that incarceration might occur can be um, a, a, a sufficient deterrent for many individuals, you know, so if they're apprehended, uh, some sort of scaffolded arrangement where there's a potential uh, that they might uh, go to jail um, is sufficient to uh, cause them uh, to take uh, the rehabilitation program seriously. But then if you are going to incarcerate people, you certainly don't need uh, to hold them in confinement for a very long period. In other words, uh, the major effect of it occurs very quickly, sometimes within the first week or the first month. And, and so the amount of time that we tend to keep people confined for is not having any additional 
uh, psychological curative potential uh, when, it, when that measure is used. So by adding on years for severity of sentence, you don't, you don't promote more um, remorse or more rehabilitation at all. In fact, what seems to be the general message is that people are likely to deteriorate after uh, an early period, you know, and, and then you're facing a whole different set of issues that are created by the incarceration experience itself. Yeah, I mean, as soon as you just give them, like, the, it becomes like a career choice of becoming an inmate for the rest of your life. Right? Or, I mean, the, the prisoner identity or the fact of having been a detainee becomes your only identity because it's been too, too long for you to be anything else. You know, you've forgotten what you were before, kind of stuff. Whereas if it is, if the correctional uh, outlook is kind of kept dominant, then incarceration is also part of the whole, you know, effort that you're making to get the person to correct. And I think that kind of goes missing in the way in which sentencing is handled, because you make it so offense-centric very often. And it is like, if this is the offense, then that is the sentence, and especially with minimum mandatory punishments coming in uh, where you absolutely insist that nothing less than this is unacceptable. And I presume all this other evidence-based thing is not feeding into how we are looking at sentencing or? No, I think, I think um, there are starting to be some connections and, and you know, and particularly because of the notion that uh, different philosophies of sentencing fit with different kinds of approaches. Um, and so when we when we when we specifically focusing on sentencing in a few days' time, yeah. um, I hope we'll have enough chance. And certainly in the reading materials that I send you, there are some interesting um, examples of some of the drug courts um, or alternative kinds of courts that have a much more rehabilitative sentencing focus and that have grown out of this sort of change, uh, where there is. Um, now a strong evaluation of the positive effect of those kinds of uh, programs. So, so I think there, there, is, there is evidence of a shift happening. Yes. First, if you're looking at these rehabilitation facilities as a substitute to incarceration, I was wondering how um, the rehabilitation or reintegration to society would be given the kind of stigma that still exists in terms of obtaining any kind of mental health treatment, and um, whether or not that stigma is as bad in terms of incarceration as opposed to mental health treatment. And secondly, in terms of perhaps meeting context where we have uh, amateur trials going on for years, like you're in, um, you're in the prison facility for a very long time while, while you're under trial, how these, um, how these kind of experiments would perhaps um, show up in India because they're at the stage of punishment. Right? So once you've already been in that facility, for example, for years, um, I was just wondering how they perhaps play out in terms of helping with the process of reintegration. You know, both both excellent questions. Um, you know, and, and as you're rightly pointing out, many times uh, people have really served a lot of their sentence by the time they get to trial. Uh, and the very unfortunate fact is that usually none of the rehabilitation programs that are available to convicted offenders are provided to those who are in that waiting period. You know, so that that is a lost opportunity. Um, and I think there have just been difficulties in figuring out uh, how to even address that concern. But you know, you're identifying a really significant gap in the way all of the structure has functioned in that regard. Um, you know, so so whether um, you know at the Makinoki Center in Canberra, some of those education programs are as available to remandees. Uh, awaiting trial as they are to those who are actually convicted, I'm not sure. That's you know that's a worthwhile question, but but I think I, you know I think there's a tremendous issue uh, just in the classification 
and the, and the availability of even rehabilitation for incarcerated offenders. With regard to your first question, um, you know, about the stigma issues and reintegration, I don't know that we have enough really good data on that. The, the one place where I have seen um, data appearing has to do with sex offender registrars. I don't know if you have those uh, in India, but they became very popular in the United States and then seem to be adopted almost everywhere um, as a way to try to address concerns by community members and community members should know if there was somebody who's a convicted sex offender or child sex offender living in their community now. And so offenders are classified and then their names go on this register and then oftentimes to implement that more directly, um, you know, in a neighborhood where I lived in California, you know, the police would knock at your door and say, we want to let you know that, you know, this sex offender has just moved into, you know, this area, you know, 12 blocks away from where you live and we see that, you know, you have young children in your house and um, please be wary, you know, this is what they look like, we'll give you a photograph of the person, um, <laughs> oh my goodness. You know? um, so, it, you know, it's, it's quite disconcerting when that happens. But um, in general, that entire policy has been rated now and evaluated as a total failure uh, because it did not reduce offending and it so stigmatized those individuals that most of them develop far worse um, mental health issues, um, social problems, you know, inability to get employment that was utterly counterproductive in terms of any, it didn't have reintegration goals, you know, that wasn't the kind of policy it was, but it, but those negative fallouts from it uh, are such that um, I think very few people uh, in the research community, in the psychological community, uh, would, would provide any support uh, for that. It's not evidence-based by any means, so very punitive um, uh, but seemingly, you know, care and protection kind of arrangement that backfired. Uh, so we need far more data, really, to look at the kinds of issues that you're raising. It's a great issue you've identified. I think we have uh, time for one more question. Are told is that the manner in which under trials and uh, convicted prisoners are treated within prison, uh, there's a relative freedom for the remandees. In the, it's a much more high security thing for people who are convicted of an offence. Visitation rights and other things are like way more rigorously. Whereas for people who are under trials, there's a relatively. I'm not, I mean, it's just relative, but it's, it is there. I would certainly think something about what we were thinking about is, uh, there are problems about uh, bringing in these rehab programs at the understaff stage, primarily because there's also uh, a necessity of, as, unless you sort of you plead guilty and you say you're going there. You know, that's basically where the difficulty comes. But I don't think there is a big case for starting to look again at the whole, you know, we had a very liberal jurisprudence in relation to bail to a certain point of time. And for us in India, what happened in is especially for uh, the, the sex offenses, rape and other things and stuff, it started to become more and more the rule of not giving bail very easily. So it was like the person was virtually halfway through whatever there could have been their punishment till they were given bail. So you were virtually standing trial in custody. And uh, if at the end of the day you were acquitted, it sort of, you know, like the sense of wrong became very high. And uh, you couldn't really, from there onwards, to do something for the person became almost an impossibility. And on the other hand, for a lot of judges, it became like this is the minimum that you know uh, to the denial of bail, keeping the person.
person in custody for a few months, keeping in mind that we have these protracted trials, it may be 8-10 years before the person gets convicted and put it other way. So they started using denial of bail as an immediate kind of a sanction that you were putting forth. So I would want to connect, you know, if you join the dots and then you start seeing that when you have good, strong, correctional, rehabilitative programs, they can recover a lot of people. So this is not the way, this ham-handed way of trying to treat what you see as a social malaise is not the way to go. Would be one kind of, uh, at least for me, one kind of learning. The other connection I wanted to make was between our discussion on uh, sexual harassment the other day and where, if you recollect, you know, when we look, the whole question of uh, hostile working environment and the fact that a very misogynistic kind of environment, what is like a promotive of a rape culture, you know, seems to be the kind of uh, the normative environment within which uh, you require to survive somehow. And if you sort of cry out, it is like uh, at several levels seen as letting down the side. Or people, even when they find some kind of mischievous behavior to be not desirable, the community is not pressing the person not to indulge in it, rather they are egging him on. I wanted to contrast that with what you narrated to us today about the very rough deal that sex offenders get inside prisons. You know, you're the one who's marked out, you're the one who's beaten up by people, you're the one who's sort of seen as the pariah, you're the one who's not to be given that sort of human human treatment. I found it very paradoxical and, you know, like in the sense if this is supposed to be the community of offenders, and within the community of offenders, you are the lowest in the petty order. And in the world outside, otherwise, where you are in non-pathological thing, this is the kind of conduct which is encouraged. Right, right. I mean, it, it is particularly the child sex offenders in prison who yeah. are violent. So, but I like I have heard reports of that even like very often people do not want people to know that they've been convicted of rape and they've come and that they would prefer to say I've come for murder because if you have come for murder, then you have a certain kind of a macho status, which if you have come in as a sex offender, you you don't have. And and I, I mean, I thought it was a if you. It's this is very contrasting kind of findings and uh, very telling that you have a social environment which is supposedly encouraging a rape culture and you have a penal environment which is saying no, <laughs> it's, it's mighty. Oh, no, that's an uh, important issue and a great thing to highlight. Yeah. Yeah, right. Right, so, so if we, I'll just get past continuing detention orders for the moment to really pick up on these themes about what is the culture uh, in a prison environment. Uh, and, um, you know, they're just these two studies that I want to uh, finish covering so that I'm sure that you're familiar with them. Uh, the most famous of which you may have heard of, um, it does seem to have in the years, as many years since it was done, um, become quite well known. So how many of you had heard of uh, the Stanford Prison Experiment? Yes, quite a few, quite a few, most of you. Right, um, and you know, and that's just remained an ongoing controversy. And even quite recently, um, Craig Haney and, and Phil Zimbardo uh, have written more about it. And as you can tell from what we put in the textbook, there even has been quite some dialogue between them and the United Kingdom researchers uh, who did a much more recent prison experiment. But uh, I want to, you know, just look at that from the social identity standpoint because this is a social psychology study looking at uh, circumstances that promote certain behaviors. And so really, I think, I mean, I think there are a few distinguishing features between those two studies that you need to highlight. So I'll run through what the study features are and then invite you to comment on what's different about them and what might account for the differences in the outcomes, you know, uh, notwithstanding what the various researchers have said about each other along the way. 
So, so you know, this was done in the 70s, which was um, early in terms of uh, human research ethic days. I don't know if you could ever get permission to do this study today under the standards that apply to human research ethics dealing with uh, any research to do with human participants, um, it would probably be considered too high risk and too dangerous and no committee would permit it. But at that point in time, uh, they did get permission. Uh, and perhaps the British study had slightly different uh, conditions because of uh, newer ethics uh, requirements that they had to meet uh, to even run their study. In this one, you know, there were 11 people role-playing the prison guards and 10 role-playing, uh, no, I think there were 11, uh, yeah, I think 11 guards and 10 prisoners, right? Um, and they pre-screened everyone to make sure that they were mentally robust uh, and, and going to be able to withstand what occurred. And they expected that this would go on for two weeks and they would uh, keep track of it as researchers, but, uh, there were such dramatic outcomes within the space of six days that they had to terminate the study. So what happened? Well, the you know the the guards um, as a, as the group pressure developed and identified with that role started engaging in more and more aggressive behavior, um, which you can see to include sexual aggression uh, to humiliate their classmates. Uh, who were role-playing the prisoners, uh, so that there were instances where in order to get compliance, they did things like simulate sodomization, make them do very demeaning things, such as wash the toilets with their bare hands, uh, and a host of other things that are detailed uh, in our text, or that you can look up on some of the videos uh, that we provide references to at the end of the chapter to see exactly uh, what transpired. But you know, they implemented solitary confinement when people didn't comply, and so on and so forth, all sorts of things that typically do go on in a prison environment, even though this was going on in you know, some dedicated space carved out in a university, uh, in the university building. Many of the prisoners, about a half of them, uh, began to have tremendous mental health responses to this uh, role, um, including depression, stress. They experienced a lot of depersonalization or dehumanization. Um, and what seemed to occur when they were placed in those circumstances is that there was a great impetus to collectively into identify with the other similarly situated prisoners um, so that that sort of solidarity was very powerful uh, you know but they they behaved very aberrantly according to their families they engaged in crying outbursts and outbursts uh, their their emotional responses were anything uh, but normal um, in the BBC prison study you know done umpteen years later um, you know, they were uh, critical of the Stanford group saying that partially what seemed to happen there maybe was just a demand response. In other words, certain conditions were set up by the experimenters, uh, you know, who might have had discussions with the guards and suggested things to them. It wasn't as naturalistic uh, in terms of the evolution of what occurred between those two groups as what they wanted to model in their study. So they had um, five guards and 10 prisoners and ran the study for eight days by comparison. Um, they did give people some guidelines at the outset with which they had to adhere. You know, and you might see that these fit within more of a human research ethics requirement. Uh, so they were told no violence will be tolerated if they're the guards. And they were given a list of prisoner rights that had to be respected. And the outcomes were very different from the Stanford experiment. In this case, though, again, the prisoners did have a very strong collective identification. Um, and they, they, in this case, um, challenged the guards' authority over them. Um, I think, I mean, I think the 
other side too, but uh, the dynamics were different. And in this case, they reversed the power and implemented more of a communal than a hierarchical system of governance in that environment. Uh, and they were able to do that by exploiting two out of the five guards who were really very ambivalent about their role and had a lot of identity conflict in actually role playing uh, the guards at all. So the other prisoners capitalized on that and were able to use that to advantage. Uh, but, it, you know, it clearly uh, their analysis here was that uh, in order to cope with the stress of the organizational environment in which they were placed, that collective identification was a key to protecting them and protecting them mentally from that. Um, you know, the major critique that was reported, um, you know, is that this was filmed and turned into a four hour BBC show, which you can download and the links are at the end of the chapter. Uh, but that perhaps this was too much of a reality show and maybe uh, that caused people to behave a certain way. Go ahead. The Stanford experiment had a film on it, no? Um, I think some of that yeah, was, yeah. was also filmed. Yeah. Yeah, but not, not quite necessarily in the same way. Yeah. No, I mean I think it, it was like fictionalized or whatever, but it was a it was a as a film it kind of shook you. And it, you know, you really sort of uh, empathize with those poor prisoners in mm -hmm. big <laughs> it, it was uh, I mean, it's not an easy film to watch, is what I guess. No, so, so I advise you, if you've not downloaded that, to follow up on that link and take a look, uh, you know, and how the students behaved in that context and what might have precipitated that. So, so any further comments on, on what you make of how these two, in some way, similar prison simulation studies turned out so differently? You know, Zimbardo and I'll say, say no. this one lacked external validity. Do you know what they mean by external validity? External validity is a threat to all studies, <laughs> often a limitation of all studies, especially simulations. Um, and has to do with the extent to which what you find in the study generalizes to the real world. So what they were arguing was that their study was more externally valid and might have generalized more to what you see goes on in actual prisons. And then, you know, they cite a whole lot of prison riot situations um, as examples of external validity, uh, whereas they argued that the BBC you know, study was very weak on those elements and therefore less generalizable. So that's one way in which they might possibly be different. Other ways? Other ways to account for the differences in the outcome? Yes. Absolutely, there, there may be other features um, 
Anything else that jumps out at you as um, a possible attribute to account for the differences? What's the The Stanford study, as such, the objective it was not to particularly look at in the environment of how prisoners are particularly treated, but it was more about the idea of how individuals are behaving when they put in a position of power, as opposed to people who are they in control of. To understand that mentality was why the entire situation of a prison was stimulated and they were made sure that they won't be able to interact with anyone outside, to really understand how it affects their mentality, and which is what I think massive difference between this study as well as that. Whereas this particularly focused on the relationship between prison guards and prisoners, and which is why they were given the list of prisoner rights, which had to be respected. I feel there's a massive difference between what Stanford prison study expected to do and what this one did. Sure. They, they, and, and, and if you read the text, you'll see that Phil Zimbardo himself said that once his colleagues started pressing him and asking him about the independent variables, um, that was another motivator for him to close down the study because of what, what really was uh, the topic of interest. Um, you know, so yes, the research might have had very different questions that were underpinning it that led them to set up the procedures uh, in a different way. Uh, I, I mean, I will tell you that I think that uh, the numbers alone uh, are so vastly different that if you have, you know, 11 guards and 10 prisoners versus 5 guards and 10 prisoners, uh, and then in the second study you find that the larger group um, has, you know, more powerful collective identity, especially when you've actually only got three functional guards and you've got two who kind of fence-sitting, um, I think that had a lot to do with the power dynamics uh, and the way that conflict was resolved in the second one that was absent uh, from the first one where uh, the groups were more evenly split, but clearly, you know, a lot of power resided in more numbers. You know, so that, that may have led to a difference as well. But the, the major take home message, I think, for both of them is that when you're put into a role and when you're put into a group, um, it's not, you know, that certain things happen about to your behavior that are contextually determined and that have very little really to do with what your own individual orientation and beliefs would be. So that people who were classmates and students started behaving very differently when assigned those roles, um, you know, in the, in the Stanford uh, experiment. And, and that's a lesson for us to learn. Uh, that we can't necessarily assess how we might behave until we're in a context like that. Okay, so I do want to just um, present you one more slide which has to do with what, e what is a growing phenomenon in our community um, of post-sentence detention. It seems from everything that I've heard that the phenomenon to be addressed in your community is sort of pre-conviction detention, um, and and maybe there's some parallel, uh, you know, to think about between these two phenomena. But but what we have had uh, legislation introduced to allow is the ongoing incarceration of individuals once they have fully served their sentence. Uh, based on individualized risk assessments that are made primarily by psychiatrists uh, who are called in uh, to use um, what are regarded as state-of-the-art risk assessments. <coughs> and um, as uh, Professor Danda indicated a moment or two ago, there are a lot of controversies surrounding uh, the extent to which a risk assessment approach that is really actuarial and statistical might be solid in terms of what it can predict about any one individual. So most of the controversy in the literature recently has surrounded exactly that question. You might have you know, very good data on how groups of people uh, who are violent offenders or sex offenders or some other subgroup of offenders behave in terms of the risk of recidivating as a group, but it doesn't necessarily help you, uh, even if someone falls into a high, middle, or moderate range, 
to predict exactly how risky or non-risky uh, that individual is at a particular time. We have, you know, got a, got a bit more sophisticated in terms of looking at dynamic than static factors. But there is an issue of generalizing from a statistical database to an individual. Even if you're doing an individual assessment, if that's what you're relying on, you're making that leap. Um, and so, so that's led to some challenges. And I think, uh, you know, most of the psychiatrists and the psychologists in the Australian professional community have enormous reservations about using that approach in this way, in this particular context. There have also been enormous legal challenges um, that come from clear violations of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights because this is regarded as arbitrary detention, double jeopardy, double detention, uh, you know, double punishment, and, and violates those principles of a fair trial that you should be released when you have uh, served whatever was regarded as uh, the end of the punishment. Um, but even constitutional challenges within Australia have utterly failed. And they did because the Attorney General's in response simply said that these were non-penal orders, so they didn't fit within the constitutional challenge to unfair punishment or excessive punishment. Uh, and mostly they are applied to sex offenders and violent offenders. And so um, the standard is, is this person, you know, giving an unacceptable risk of reoffending and therefore for a danger. Um, the, at, at best, they get an annual review uh, once continuing detention orders are imposed. The concern is that the same will, of course, apply to anyone convicted of a terror-related offense, and that once you stop doing this for various groups of offenders, um, it becomes itself you know, a change in what our normal sentences so I don't know if you have any parallel here. Do you have continuing detention orders as well as uh, you know the references that you've made to long detention before any uh, proceedings finalised? but generally that's not a post-conviction thing. Uh, some people, when they, you know, like it's, if you're sort of set out on probation or you are given a, a kind of a lesser thing then you are being uh, looked at more. In the whole realm of uh, people who are uh, convicted for terror offenses, the whole question of your going out into the community is only very, very difficult, even post-deprivation. You know, like, okay, let me say it differently. Your norms in relation to remission, your, uh, the kind of thing which would be permitted on strength of which other offenders are allowed to be discharged after a certain calculation of how the doesn't apply for certain offenders. So it's more like keeping people in, when you're saying you're going to continue detention, then it's not detention in the community more than a continuing detention in detention. More difficult to get remission, more difficult to be sort of, you know, where we've started to have a body of offenses where life imprisonment actually means imprisonment for life. Otherwise, it, it basically was that there was a certain calculation which operated subsequent to which you were allowed to get into the community. I think, and this is only possibly uh, other colleagues may have a better information, as there are certain kind of offenses where there are reporting obligations for a certain period of time after release. You're required to kind of, you know, show yourself up uh, in the nearest police station. First go register yourself, then periodically keep coming to say that you've not been getting an any job. I think that will be the closest to and, and that's really part of the sentencing yeah, yeah, determination. I mean, it's, it's a procedure of release that you require. And it doesn't apply for all offences, but for some offences, that kind of procedure is. 
Uh, if you look at the case example that we provided in the text of someone who is subjected to a continuing detention order, you'll see that one of the questions that was asked was the extent to which that individual had participated in some of the rehabilitative treatment programs uh, in jail because uh, the argument was going to be made that if they had successfully graduated from those kinds of programs, then perhaps the risk had already been reduced. Um, you know, and, and that places a huge premium on the evaluation of those programs as successful and demonstration that they work. And so what is going on in our correctional arena at the moment is intensive flurrying of activity to evaluate all manner of correctional programs to, so that we know whether there's evidence of them working or not. Because otherwise, they are simply window dressing you know, and a hive of activity with, with no real meaning. Um, and so making sure that they do have traction is, is an imperative. Uh, and and as, I, as I mentioned earlier, trying to ensure that those evaluations are done by independent third parties with, you know, some distance from the actual delivery of the program uh, is also important so that they are objective assessments. So that, that's an important issue. And with respect to our terror-related detainees, um, the Australian government has now set up an intensive program of de-radicalization that is administered as an intervention to those individuals. And as far as I know, none of those are yet evaluated uh, at all. But those are going to be the kinds of issues that will be looked at when you know determining post-sentence whether somebody uh, is uh, more or less eligible for release. So what that, evidence based on this? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so there's an immense amount of work at, at that end. All right, I think we are at the end of our uh, time period. Um, and so um, I think we can close for today. Uh, thank you uh, for your attention and participation. Uh, and uh, we'll take up next on Monday. Tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow is Saturday. We, we, we're, we're doing, I think we're doing families and children tomorrow. So, sorry, I'm confused. I'm thinking today is Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the chances are that we will be doing tomorrow's class again at the same hour, but you will be officially notified about that and how the substitution thing is happening. We make a swap with whatever is a 9 to 11 class. They do it in a manner where nothing goes awry. And also, I think because we have uh, uh, Shandivan coming to speak it tomorrow, so we worked out in a manner that we can carry on both the programs. Uh, for Shandivan's program and for this one, you have a notice coming in later in the day. Thanks. And, uh, so I get into my business. Okay, Abhishek Chha, uh, Angelina, Anna Thomas, Avanendra Khare, yes, Diksha Singh, yes, Monica Dhonan, yes, Harshida Reddy, yes, Karan Gupta,
मुक्पन पाजी नेहा शिवारे पूर्वी खन्ना राहुल जोशी राहुल जोशी विजय लॉकी रोहित बिरापली पावली कैंपी समितेश सिंह सोमया स्थाना शाहूल शशांक मनी त्रिपाठी शुभम पत्थरिया शुभम सचिति शुभम शर्मा श्री चंदना सुजना बेग विदुषी संगारिया लक्ष्मी विनोदना याशिमा अनिल रामकृष्ण मंजुश्री राम श्री जोय भट्टाचार्य सिद्धू नगरवाल साधिका बुलाती बुशालगर आयुष मिश्रा निशा रहेजा शिव सायकसार शिवता श्वेता राव सिद्धार्थ शेखर विशेष भाटिया यश कर्णकर अभिजीत सिंह रावली अखिला दीक्षिता अखिला अश्विन मूर्ति आशना चौधरी ललित शर्मा अलवी देवी सितारा वैभव आलोक आलोक कुमार 